Your kids are soft. You lack discipline. We landed on the moon! You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility. I slightly forgotten who we are. Explorers, pioneers. For all the people that are here live, us, cool. Um, May 10th and 11th, I realize it's Mother's Day weekend, but if you love your mom more than continue education, I don't want to hang out with you anyways. Uh, we're doing a class in Charlotte at uh, actually the gym next to Clay Sankey's uh, clinic and uh, yeah, RX3. You can check out anthroedu.com for that. The next class after that would be Art Assessment in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. And then we got one coming to the farm in August. So pretty stoked about that. And any, any updates from you? Mm, going to Minneapolis to hang out with the Northwestern crew in two weeks for Fundamentals mm -hmm. with Utley. All right. So Very cool. What are you guys going to do? What are we going to do for fun? What are we going to do yeah. to... besides <laughs> class? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, like well, he's not going to go like hunt a bear or something while he's in Minneapolis. I don't know. Bear, it gets to be cold, right? In April. I, I would and imagine it's probably going to be cold. cold. Yeah. He might try to go ice fishing. Uh, I like... think ice fishing <laughs> season's over. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about there. I feel like he tries to make a way. Yeah, there probably is. Okay. Well, I'm going to get into my case. Uh, I'm also going to keep tabs on my email. I was trying to look at the group to see if I yeah. got Facebook, but I can't seem to find the residency. Oh, there you go. No, yeah, nobody said anything. My whole computer is not working. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Nothing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you are watching this and you haven't listened to the podcast with myself and Stephen Capabianco, it's called the Trigger Point Discussion Part One. Uh, I also, if you're a residency member, which you're on here live, uh, which would no one, uh, I put a citations list on the residency Facebook page. Uh, all of the articles we went through, I can't remember how it, one, two, three, four, I don't know, like 12 of them. So that's on there. It's also on the um page on anthro or on the farm on the uh, podcast page as well so check that out uh sean sherman's podcast released today it was a really cool one and then i put part one on the trigger point discussion because i think there was a lot of room left to talk about treatment of trigger point soft tissue because we talked a lot about the why and you know why are these things uh present what are the mechanisms behind them um I mean, we could go a lot of different ways on that in terms of assessment and treatment so hopefully we'll bring Kapo back on here in the next month or two and dive into more of the treatment aspect both from his perspective but uh just the the evidence overall so let's get rolling case today is 17 year old female level 10 gymnast i say d1 hopeful because she should be doing d1 gymnastics but she's kind of I would say was doubting that. I don't think she's doubting it quite as much anymore, which is kind of cool. Um, Sloan had worked with this patient previously um, for a few issues, but that had been a while. So the reason she was coming in uh, for this visit, which was about three weeks ago, was her initial visit with me. I've never seen her before. Is about four and a half months ago, prior to that first visit, she had surgery to repair a grade three ATFL, um, which is a rupture. Why do we even have to grade that? Why can't we just say <laughs> rupture? Like grade one, grade two, rupture. Uh, and a deltoid ligament rupture, uh, both on her right foot from, she'd have numerous uh, inversion sprains, but then she had an inversion sprain and then an eversion sprain. And then that's when that catalyzed ortho visits and getting everything looked at. Uh, since her surgery, which was four and a half months ago, or now almost five and a half months ago, she's been doing post-op PT and she's still not doing quite a few things in gymnastics by the time she comes and sees me. She's not doing floor at all. Uh, she's barely doing beam. She's not landing off bars and she's definitely not doing vault because pretty much any landing hurts her ankle in particular landing backwards. Mm -hmm. And now she's self-reported that she's losing kind of confidence in herself, not just pain, but like, I don't know if I can do these things. Cause she's kind of even, you can tell she's wrestling with, I don't know if it's a pain in my ankle or if it's literally 
Like I just, I'm, I have a fear avoidance. Like she doesn't say that exactly, but you can kind of tell while we're going through the history. So she's running around at kind of like a six out of 10 in pain when she does something. She's like, I don't have a ton of pain. Even if she walks a lot, it's like, if she goes to punch really hard, land backwards, something like that, she has pain at the anterior portion of her ankle mortis joint, just kind of across that band. And again, she had deltoid and ATFL uh, ligament for repair. So she also notes this, I'm quoting, this is her quote, that it just seems like she needs to be doing something different or more. That was her words in terms of what she's been doing and uh, with PT. So on exam, and I question her a lot and why I say D1 hopeful. So while I'm talking to her, as we get towards the end of the uh, history intake, I just kind of say, well, are you uh, wanting to do gymnastics in college? She goes, yeah. And I was like, well, what's that? She goes, well, I wanted to do gymnastics. I go, like, what level are we talking? She goes, I, you know, probably D1. I go, well, probably. I go, do you want to do it or do you not want to do it? She goes, yeah, if my ankle wouldn't stop. I go, no, no, no. Do you want to do it or do you not want to do it? She goes, I want to do it. Okay. Okay. That's the only question. Right. So let's just start from there. So trying to get clarity on her goals, not superimpose my goals, but figure out, do you actually want to do this thing? Cause that also tells me how much work we have to do depending on what's going on. Um, uh, so on just kind of presentation, she has a grade one bunion on her uh, right hallux. She went on, uh, I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but I, there's not a good place to put these besides just general presentation. We could put them in special tests. But when I have her do a heel raise on that right foot in particular, she kind of collapses through her rear foot, which you can imagine now why she has a bunion, right? She's kind of collapsing into the medial side of her foot. She's got a bunion on that side. She doesn't have that on her left side. Um, and then when we take her again, skipping ahead here, uh, lack of kind of a punctum fixum of her TL junction, lumbar spine and three months supine. So things that for a level 10 gymnast should be pretty easy. Somebody that's coming on to correct me from Ron Sloan releve is that, uh, on your toes, a heel raise. So I said heel raise the other day and she goes releve. This was the gymnast. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Um, so easy things that she's doing all the time, creating a hollow body position, which is, you know, analogous to three months supine, all these things. So, uh, on top tier dysfunctional, non painful, multi-segmental flexion, just sit, she can touch her toes. She's a gymnast. Her lumbar spine is kind of flat as a board, but obviously she's flexible enough so that she can still palm the floor, which, you know, maybe creates some issues. Dysfunctional, painful, a deep squat. So that same kind of pinchy anterior, anterior medial ankle pain. And she says that's like a one, one and a half. And the more I've gotten to know this uh, girl, she's super tough uh, as most gymnasts are. On gait, as you would imagine, there's kind of a excessive or quick rear foot eversion on the right through kind of mid stance to toe off. So she kind of like almost, I would say wiggles right into that rear foot eversion. It's like in and out, um, on range of motion, she has decreased ankle dorsiflexion, uh, of the right. I don't know why I put bilateral. That's not right at all. Uh, ankle dorsiflexion of her gastroc or of her right ankle. And I think that's like a soft tissue limitation. Uh, when we do full range of motion, which is on the palpation, we get that same pinch. So if I really load her, if she's in supine with passive dorsiflexion, she gets lit up with pain at the anterior, anterior medial border. And she calls it a pinch, which we pulled the skin up off of, you know, just above that area of her ankle. She's like, yeah, I don't really have any pain. It's kind of interesting. Um, doing the same dorsiflexion yeah like jamming her into dorsiflexion just kind of tenting the skin above the mortise joint uh just proximal to the mortise joint uh neuro i threw that this portion in here so she's a four out of five on ankle dorsiflexion on the right and it's kind of she tries to cheat it by going into e version so mm -hmm. you test dorsiflexion she's out in e version why do these things matter? You're like, oh, well, you know, like maybe you're getting too picky. She's four and a half months into post-op PT. If anything should be good, it should be passive range of motion, like dorsiflexion and strength. strength. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, so that's what I kind of told her and her mom right away. I was like, these things, let alone not being able to do a vault, like these should have been cleared out easily. And the fact that they're not, yeah, something's going on. Uh, so on palpation, tenderness to touch over anterior mortis joint. Man, my spelling is abysmal. I'm glad you guys can't see this. Maybe it's autocorrect. That says mortises joint. 
uh, pain with passive plantar flexion at anterior ankle. So if you plantar flex her fully, she gets kind of a pull that she says, you know, goes into the pain realm and, uh, pain with passive dorsiflexion. We said at anterior medial ankle, uh, soft tissue restriction on uh, and dorsiflexion of the tricep surrey. And I think there, or I felt a trigger point in the medial gastroc. Now, how important is that trigger point in this whole scenario? I don't know if it's that critically important and we'll get to why, uh, mid T spine extension restriction. Welcome to a elite gymnast and slight paresthesia over uh, lateral and medial scar which I think is a big deal to ask a lot of people. Like we just had another girl, uh, that had a, uh, ankle surgery and same thing. We were asking, Hey, do you, you know, what's a scar feel like to you? And she's like, yeah, it's kind of numb. If you have numbness over a scar, you have alt altered feedback. You already have altered feedback if you have a scar. So that's something we can have somebody start doing scar work on their own that day, which again, four and a half months into PT, we would hope to God like that was already done, but it wasn't. So that's something we coached her on right away. Uh, no positive orthopedic tests through the ankle. And then uh, for a pain audit, one of the other things that I had her do when we were looking at, uh, you know, special testing, whatever you want to call it, is just had her do double leg and single leg jumps. So double leg jumps, she's like, nah, it doesn't really cause any pain. She's also been already doing gymnastics and jump roping, which is much higher level than just jumping. Single leg jumping was provocative of pain at the anterior ankle. So that's what I decided to use a pain audit. I know I had pain on these passive ranges of motion, but I'm going to use some of that for a functional audit. So as I said, there is a soft tissue restriction through the triceps surrey for ankle dorsiflexion. And you'd be like, well, why didn't you use the trigger point? All right. Cause trigger points, maybe you're like, oh, that's more important. As you'll see in this case, I think there's a lot of fear avoidance behavior. She even stated that, like, I think I'm afraid. I think my confidence is lacking. With that being the case, I don't know if I want to, if you feel her other calf, she's a gymnast. She's literally on point, releve, whatever you want to call it all the time. Like, it's kind of like a runner. Like, their calves are wound up. So I think sometimes if you're like, oh, yeah, this trigger point matters, like, does it? Because that might be, I hate to say normal, but mm -hmm. common with that athlete profile. So I just said, Hey, that dorsiflexion restriction, um, as much as I wouldn't, I almost wanted to write in here for a functional audit, like the strength deficit. I know that's not a classic audit, but like, that's something that I think we should have back mm -hmm. pretty quick. Cause I don't think that's neurologic per se, right? We're not seeing, you know, dermatomal, myotomal kind of linkage there. Um, but then I have a kind of further out one, which would be that heel raise, right? Where she spills into her midfoot and she has that bunion. Again, not a pure functional audit, but it's something I want to see change as we go through this thing. Return to play criteria or RTP for her, because that's what I asked her. I go, did you have, like, are you cleared from PT? She goes, yeah, technically I am. We're just still doing strengthening stuff. So I go, what was your like return to play stuff? She goes, what do you mean? We're, I'm still going. They just said I could go back to gymnastics. It's kind of interesting. Um, maybe there was, I don't know. She's not a PT. Mm -hmm. So I said, Hey, you have to be able to do a single leg rebound off of like a pretty tall box, which today we had on a 24 inch box because that's like minimal compared to landing off a vault or landing off a beam, like minimal. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we can't do that without pain. I don't think you should be doing those things because you probably are changing movement every time you do them. And then I said another one, um, and I explained this to her more t in today's visit. I said, I'd like to see you do something like a back pedal. And at any point during like a full speed back pedal, I could just clap and you'd have to put the brakes on on that right foot and then take off in a sprint in the opposite direction because you're never doing that. So it's not something that's like jump bound related. It's putting different stressors on the ankle. That way I feel like I'm taking her outside of sport specific stuff, demanding that her triceps and her Achilles and her ankle do something different in a ballistic load, change of direction. Um, so she got that which we have not done that yet. I'll tell you, we're going to do it next visit because she's worn slippers the last two visits. I'm not really going to do that out on the pavement. My treatment focus is uh, foot intrinsic stability slash motor control with central stabilizing strategy, which surprise, surprise there. It seems like it always is. But her having that slight bunion, the rear foot, rear foot E version on gate, the kind of midfoot collapse on a heel raise, uh, I didn't, you'll see here in a second, I didn't test pure strength on the calf raise stuff because we sent her home with that. But these are basic things that A, exist on the left. 
right? That she has a good pattern, you know, going through heel raise on the left. Uh, she doesn't have a bunion. They're existing on the right. She's had chronic ankle sprains led to this, you know, acute uh, eversion ankle sprain. And here we are with the surgery. And if I had to put a diagnosis on this at this point in time, and this is how I explained it to her and her mom, I said, you know, where your pain is, the fact that you're having prolonged pain after surgery, there may be an osteochondral lesion, right? Or some sort of, you know, chondral defect in the Taylor dome. The only reason I put that out there is that's a possibility. The more likely scenario, if I didn't have to put an ICD-10 code on it, would be when they repair your deltoid ligament, your ATFL, they like tighten those things up. There's probably just a lot of compression on her ankle. Then you add in all the tension from her tricep surrey, and then you add in fear avoidance stuff. I think she's just literally compressing the snot out of her ankle. But then when we go to test it, right? When we do dorsiflexion resistance here in a second, you'll see the results of uh, repeated calf raises. She fails on strength. So it's like high threshold that fails fast. That's mm -hmm. the worst scenario to put somebody in mm -hmm. for a ballistic sport like gymnastics, put them two and a half hours into practice and like wait for their ankle to explode. Mm -hmm. Um, I know this is not a diagnosis, but I wrote it in here that I put fear avoidance. Like you're going to see that the way, the speed, the rapidity that things change during this case, there's no way that it's like a motor control issue, neurophysiologic, obviously not pathologic, that there had to be a lot of uh, central processing things that were going on. So first treatment, we adjust her T-spine. I think uh, she's a gymnast, man. You can just do it all day long. I did some stecco soft tissue work around a longer anterior tib, in particular, the tendon as it crosses ankle mortis joint, um, along with her uh, gastroc tricep surrey. I wasn't going to go in there and dry needles, just kind of getting some input. I did some hands-on scar work as I was teaching her what she was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then we worked three months supine, which she's not terrible at. She's just not great at for being this high level of gymnast and having worked with Sloan before. So it's like something she's done, she's still not good at. And she even kind of self-admitted that. Uh, single leg hanging stance on that right side, which she did pretty well. Um, and then her homework was simply a squeeze and lift drill. So if you're not familiar with that, we have her on both legs. She's got a lacrosse ball in between her heels. She's squeezing, and then she's driving through her first ray, which is a coaching mechanism. She did that well enough. I said, hey, do this for a day or two, and then get rid of that drill. And what I want you to try to do is with that mechanism, we kind of talked about moving through your big toe, through the ball of your foot, start trying to do four sets of however many reps you can do of just calf raises. Mm -hmm. So we can start seeing, is it an actual strength deficit? Is it, you know, whatever it is, patterning. I want her to foam roll her calf and ankle triplanar mopes. So again, some people may be like, dude, that's super boring. Like, you know, squeeze and lift, calf raises, foam roll. She can't do fundamental things four and a half months post-op. Why would I send her home with like hang stance? Like, what are you doing? Like, they're not going to do it well anyways. So treatment two, she comes in and this is self-reported because we now have a little subjective thing in uh, the Jane app. So she says, I'm 10% better. I say, what's that mean? She goes, I just have less pain with like the stuff I was already doing in gymnastics, like a little bit less. Okay. Uh, she said that she was only able to get like four sets of 12 of the heel raises before she just literally fatigue out. I was like, that's kind of a big deal. So again, what the hell were they doing in PT? If you weren't doing calf raises with an ankle injury, I'm not dogging any PTs. Cause I got some good friends that are PTs. I know a lot of really good PTs, but if I had to pick some dumb, dumb exercise, if you said ankle injury and I was just like a caveman, I think I'd say calf raises. <laughs> calf raises yeah that'd be a good All one around. what the hell like a legitimate deficit here okay so she comes in the cool thing was this uh dysfunction on painful on deep squat now so that pain cleared out with that already uh still pain with pogo jump all of our kind of functional audits are still there the trigger point in your gastroc all the dorsiflexion restriction all still present right? Slight weakness. So I graded a four out of five on dorsiflexion resistance as well. So we get back into treatment. It's uh, we don't really go back to three months. I say, Hey, let's just keep working those in the gym because she, another thing to talk about here is she's going to have a lot of time at gymnastics practice where she's not doing the things the rest of the team is. So when they're doing 
Um, the only part of bar she's doing is anything where she doesn't land. So she's doing skills on the bar. She's not dismounting. She's not doing any beam at this point. She's not doing any floor, obviously not doing any vault. So there's a lot of conditioning, downtime. It's like, hey, you can be doing dead bugs, dead bug variations. You know how to do this. I'll send you videos. Cool. I don't need to do that in here. We do hang position um, with heel raise variations. So really patterning, moving through the first tray, not losing position in the knee. This is absolutely cooking her hip. Like just glute me to smoking. Uh, so I say, okay, let's work more of the, uh, you know, calf raises. We got to build those up. But in office, we did what I call a single leg wall push. So imagine you're on an angle, like you'd be pushing a car, but you're pushing the wall and we have her up on her toes. And then we're just asking her to stay on her toes and let her knee kind of go through, you know, 90 degrees knee flexion and then drive through the wall to get back to knee extension. I mean, just like, uh, like five reps in just massive perturbation going on. So I said, Hey, you have an option. You can do like, you know, four sets of your calf raises at practice. And then maybe when you go home or earlier in the day, you do like, you know, a couple sets of these wall pushes. So you're kind of mixing in how you're loading on the ankle in office. We worked on diagonal single leg deadlifts. We worked on this little split squat heel raise variation. So just imagine you're in the bottom of a split squat, your knees hovering and you're just working like coming up on your toes and heel down the challenger. Um, and the only thing I sent her home with extra that time was single leg wall pushes. She comes in treatment three. She's like, I'm 30% better. Again, that was her words. She said, I can get the four sets of 25 heel raises. She's, I mean, she's type A gymnast. She said, they're still not perfect um, towards the end, but I'm getting better. So I say, hey, let's keep going body weight for another week. Then we'll start adding weight to those, getting to the point that I want to load her up with that like ideal world, 150% of body weight on, you know, uh, calf rate, like double leg calf rate. So we get a lot of like load through there. So this visit, I just said, Hey, this is going to be way more of a workout. So we put her back down into dead bugs, wrapped a band around the, uh, dorsum of her ankle and did loaded basically heel taps and dead bug where I'm trying to break her out of that, you know, d- dorsiflexion position. Cause she's having to go through triple flexion and, you know, she had a little weakness there. Mm-hmm. So I'm just patterning that she can go through this. Diagonal single leg deadlifts again, lateral lunges with throws, trying to break her out of the sagittal plane. Cause again, she hurt her ankle in the coronal plane. So we need to kind of reintroduce her to that. Um, which I haven't done, which I actually forgot about. I was going to do butterfly squats with her today, but lateral lunge throws, which she was okay at. She, I'll talk about this in a second. She's not very good at using her hip or her knee together. It's like, she'll go way back into her hip, like a gymnast that kind of sticks their butt out when they they land or she'll get really up on her toes and her knees, but like connecting those two, which we worked on today is like not present, which I think is a big deal. Uh, single leg D cells. So just jumping off a box, trying to land soft. We even went into like a skater squat out of that. Like, Hey, can you land soft and, you know, lower your left knee to the floor. So she has a lot of control there. And then we did some rebounds out of that as well. Uh, she also said during this visit that her aerials are opening up in terms of her hip. I don't know what that means. I asked at high desk Sloan. I, she would have to explain it. I'm assuming that means, I don't know what that means, but she said, that's a good thing. Cool. Uh, which is cool because we're not really working on her hip. Uh, she said at the end of that visit that she was going to, for that week, I think this was on a Thursday. So over the weekend and, you know, early part of the week, she was going to work on landing on her right foot on round offs and maybe some like uh, reverse landing just on like ground skills. Like, I don't know, like a back tuck or something like that. That's what she said going to do. Just simple stuff. Since so Sloan the next day, I think, sends me a video off Instagram of her doing a beam routine with dismount, uh, a few other things that looked like totally fine to me. I was like, oh, that's that's a bit advanced for wanting to do those things, which she came in and I asked her, I go, how you doing? She said, I'm 50% improved. And she also says her words, my confidence is up 10%. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I didn't ask her that. That's what she said. So now we're, we're doing basically the same thing. So she, I would say at this point, strength is maybe, I mean, you'd have to grade it like a four plus or something. I don't know. Like it's right off the edge of being perfect, right? For the dorsiflexion restriction, uh, or sorry, uh, resistance, dorsiflexion restrictions gone. Uh, so that's good. She has no pain on single leg jumps anymore. 
Like she's doing really good. She's doing high level stuff. She should be doing good. We do basically the same stuff. Uh, we mix in some throws with the lateral lunge catches. We do some skater jumps, uh, split squat, heel lifts. I take those split squat heel lifts and put her on our beam in the office. So she's midline because that looks reminiscent of a lot of skills. We work that in. We also worked in some narrow base balance progression stuff where we're basically messing with her visual targeting for like vestib vestibular ocular reflex, whole body VOR, and then VORC where we're taking her eyes with her. Uh, and those really threw her off. Like she was kind of even like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, you this needs to get better even though that had nothing to do with your ankle, like, let's just work on that as a gymnast. Uh, I think she really liked that because she saw like, yeah, that wasn't great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, hey, let's use that as a warm up before we get into gymnastics practice. And I just sent her home with pretty much everything we did as a circuit. Because she's like, they have a strength conditioning coach that programs for them, but she said that she doesn't think they do enough of it at gymnastics, which maybe that's just her because she's not able to do stuff. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So we sent her home with diagonal single leg deadlifts, those split squat lifts and said she could load them up with a little bit of cross body weight, like a offset carry a kettlebell position if she was feeling up to it. Uh, lateral lunges and um, I think that's what we sent her home with. I have her jump rope and stuff like that. So she comes in today, which I didn't have time to write this out, but I just saw her today. So I remember it all. Um, I take her to the gym. She says she's doing like, she had no gymnastics over the weekend. So she's been doing her drills. So she had nothing to report in terms of like, Hey, I'm doing better from gymnastics. She's like, I'm doing really good. I don't have any pain. Uh, this is five visits in somebody who wasn't doing anything. And again, now she's still not doing floor as of now she's doing beam. She's, uh, has an unvault. Those are two biggest ones. She's starting to dismount from bars. Now we talked about college and what she's wanting to do today, all these things, goals. And then we go over to the gym. So I had her doing high level stuff, 24 inch box, single leg D cells, like does okay. When you have her jump off a 20 or no, an 18 inch box backwards. So just jump off. She wasn't loading her right leg. She's like offloading the left. I was like, do you know you're doing that? She goes, yeah, I can tell. How, I, I don't know what to do about it. So this gets into, I was like, you're just, I go, I don't know anything about gymnastics. So when a gymnast lands or when she would land, She'd just stick her butt way out and she'd have this like, you know, landing position arms out. And I go, how much knee bend is allowed for, you know, a good like dismount, like uh, landing position? She goes, she showed me basically like a quarter squat, which would be analogous to like a, a DNS hang position where we'd say like the toes never, or sorry, your knee never goes past the like MTPs, right? So I go, perfect. I go, let your knees bend that much when you jump off the box instead of not letting them bend at all. Mm. And she was like, how do I do that? I go, well, let's just try to land on your toes. And we're having her jump off like two foot backwards. So she has to like catch herself instead of just jumping down mm. and she could do it. And then she's like, oh, okay. Soft landing. Then I go, okay, land on your toes and land, let your heels land like toe, heel, toe, heel. Did that a bunch of times. Then I go, just jump off. She could do it. And then I go, now I want you to jump off, jump back on the box like three times in a row and then stick the last one. So you're kind of making her just do, 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 do. back, did it. And I was like, we're going to do this on one foot. She's a gymnast, right? So she's literally one foot, if you can imagine, jumping like, I would say almost two feet backwards, back and forth onto the box on one foot, going back and forth, and then could stick the last one. She was like, oh, wow. She's, I was like, how much at her? She goes, I have like a one out of 10. I was like, perfect. <laughs> so then I took her back up to the 24-inch box and had her jumping off backwards, landing like that. And at first she was like, huh. Cause she's not landed backwards at all. And I go, no, 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 mm -hmm. jump off and do what we just did. And she just landed. She's like, oh, I have no pain. And then she like, I was like, now jump up. And she jumped up and landed, which is still nothing like coming off the ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> landed, no pain. And I was like, I'm not saying run in there and do this stuff. But like, I, again, fear avoidance. I think you built some patterns. We literally had to coach her how to do like a miniature squat. Mm -hmm. It was either hips or toes, hips or toes, like no like compression of her ankle, right? She was skipping it. She wanted to dorsiflex. She just wanted to go on her hips. She wanted to go up on her toes. Um, and then when she goes up on her toe on her right side, it's not a great scenario for the medial side of her ankle because that mm. like bunion kind of deal. So it was really cool to see. Then we weighted up. We used like a 36 kilo kettlebell for diagonal single leg deadlifts. We weighted up again, uh, cross body carry or position for the split squat variations. Um, what else did we do today over there? 
we did triple jump, like uh, not a typical triple jump, like just three hops on the same leg, sticking the last landing, just really trying to battery test her. Because that's what I told her. I go, my job now is to see where you break. Um, she killed all that stuff. And she was like sweating. And I think kind of liked that she like got pushed a little bit and like super confident. So that was today. So that's five visits in as of today. After four and a half months post-op PT, not doing any of this stuff. And then I kind of asked her, I go, what do you want to go try for the rest of the week? She goes, I'm probably going to try a little bit of everything. I was like, okay, that's up to you. So I will give a, a full feedback report on this one. Cause I just thought it was really cool that obviously we had a legitimate injury. We had uh, another injury, AKA a surgery rehab, which got her pretty far, not all the way. And you know, the main takeaway I want to be from this case is we've been dealing with some like high school issues and things like that, which have made forced me and all of us to kind of maybe reframe or think about what we do. So what we were kind of talking about last Friday was we know we don't really want to see, well, no, we don't want to see post-op stuff. I don't, I don't think these guys do. I think it's boring, but yeah. super boring. Um, I mean, immediate post-op, like we want to see, we want to be the cleanup crew. We're going to be batting clean up on this stuff and see them when they need these finer touches, getting back into sports, what's going on, compensatory mechanisms. We want to see those. Now, the other side is, do we want to see somebody right after an acute injury? I would love it. There's a lot of other people that maybe think they're better at it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I think anybody can do in the first week to two weeks of an acute, let's just use an ankle sprain. An acute ankle sprain should be a great example. Everybody's going to kind of do the same thing. Maybe we'd speed it up on some of the load progressions and things like that. But after that's when we see them, and I think that gives the perfect niche within the market to coexist with other people that are doing post-op, acute care, things like that. And it's like, do we we can work with the same people. Um, could we do that other stuff? Sure, we have done that other stuff. But I just thought that was a unique experience to see what we've been talking about at play of like, I don't want to do what they did. Would I, I think they should have done stuff different because if I'm, if I'm being honest, I think 12 weeks, you should be done like with that case post-op unless something went haywire. Um, and that doesn't mean like she's full board gymnastics, but you should not be in PT anymore. You should be strength conditioning, training, stuff like that. Uh, so I just thought it was a cool case and she's a really tough kid. And this is only probably the third gymnast I've worked with because I've had to see a couple since Sloan's been out. Um, I can see why they're fun for Sloan to work with because they'll literally, for the most part, do what everyone do. They're tough as nails, very good athletes. So you can kind of just push them all over the place and see what happens. Uh, but it's like your perfect patient. You're just like, can you do this? Yeah, I'll go do that. I'll do a bunch of it. Oh, you want me to do more of it? Cool. Or they'll do stuff that you didn't tell them to do. Like I'm going to go do, you know, giant things on the beam when I just said I was going to do a round off. Awesome. Good. Good for you. But she hadn't been... That visit, you hadn't said, go do the beam? No, she told me, no, it, after treatment three, she said, I'm going to go work. She said she hadn't been doing round offs where she landed on her right foot. So yeah. she wouldn't do them to the, ground. the, was that to the right, I guess? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, but she wouldn't, she was only laying on her left foot for round offs. Mm -hmm. So she goes, I'm going to go do that. And then I'm going to try some small backward landings, like just floor, like, you know, tumbling. And then someone sends me this video, which I could post if I could find it, but a full beam routine with the dismount and all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, mm. okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else on there, but she probably, so what the discussion was for continuance of care for her. So I've seen her two times a week for, you know, the sixth visit will be this Thursday. And then I said, Hey, let's try to just do once next week. Like you're progressing. Yeah. You're not heavily into gymnastics uh, in terms of competition right now, she's a junior. Um, that's why we were talking about college. Cause she, the other kind of thing that was interesting in the combo today, which is one of the reasons to ask about people's goals and things is I was like, well, who have you talked to in terms of college? She told me some people, she goes, yeah, but I did this all right before the surgery. And then when I had the surgery, everything just stopped, mm -hmm. which sucks. So she's going to have to work extra hard if she wants to get even probably the same looks because now they know like yeah she's good but she's also had which gymnastics lends itself to injuries and surgeries like that but she's gonna have to be like yeah i came back from a surgery so it's like i hate to say it but it's kind of like tainted goods like they're like are you as good as you were yeah i mean it's probably 
I don't know. I, I think again, our Common. knowledge of gymnastics is limited, but I feel like if I had her versus, um, let's say I've had another gymnast who's had a pars defect or something like I would rather that. Oh, than a pars defect. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Which I feel like her ankle thing is not as common. Granted, I just saw somebody who also had an ankle. Oh, here's another interesting point. Talking about other injuries. She was asking me, she goes, well, do I need to tape my ankle? I go, I, I go, how do you usually tape it? She just typical athletic tape. Athletic and I go, tape, yeah. you know, it really doesn't do anything. Like after a certain period of time, I go, I know you could do it as size one. It's not really doing yeah, much. She goes, shedding. really? I go, yeah. So I go, if I were you, while you're not doing much, I would not tape it. She came in, she goes, yeah, my ankle feels fine. I don't know. And I go, I'm not telling you not to do that. Cause I don't want to be the guy that like mm-hmm. you blow out your ankle and you go, oh, I didn't tape it. But we know for sure that plain white athletic tape after 15, 20 minutes, it's not doing anything. Absolutely mm-hmm. nothing. So it'll be cool to see if she's like, oh, I've been leaning on that tape. And yeah. So I was trying not to build another psychological like, mm-hmm. crutch while she's really like seeking out like what's going on with my ankle. But it's a cool case nonetheless. Um, like I said, I'll, maybe not next time because that would only be two weeks. I'd like to see a month out because she'll be, she'll be full, full, full go by that time, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. yeah cool. what you got alex okay so this this patient this was towards the end of february uh 53 year old male runner uh trail runner i've seen him before for other issues previously over the last i guess two years or so um he's one of those patients that i saw like probably pretty early on in preceptorship or maybe towards the middle uh, but came in with right anterior hip pain and left low back pain that had begun the previous weekend. Said he rolled over in bed, felt a pop in his right hip, followed by intense pain that had worsened ever since. And he was concerned that he had uh, dislocated his hip. Mm. <laughs> and I told him, I said, he, <laughs> he asked me, he said, so do you think I dislocated my hip? And I said, man, you're if you were 95 female and not active, maybe, but rolling over in bed, throwing your hip out. I feel like you did not do that. Um, mainly bothered him in standing and walking, uh, and running. He was able to go for a run. He typically runs six to eight miles at a time. Uh, it's probably running four to five days a week would be my guess. And he said he was able to limp through a run that morning, but was paying for it. Uh, and low back did not start bothering him until uh, that day, which was three days after it started bothering him. That was when I saw him for the first time, described as a burning sensation. So on the contralateral side of his low back. Um, he knows that he hasn't had any sudden increases in training volume. Um, he's not training necessarily for a race. His He and his wife are hoping to do the Tour de Mont in the, Al- the Alps, in July, which is a hundred mile, hundred miles covered in 10 days, uh, between running and hiking. But he mainly just, he's kind of just trains at that level all the time and, and likes being active. He, he and his wife both do. So, uh, he came walking in noticeably in a lot of pain and not, mm-hmm. not walking normal. Um, so on exam, it was a shortened SFMA. I really just looked at, um, multi-segmental flexion, extension, rotation, all of which were dysfunctional, um, non-painful except for right rotation. So it's right hip pain, left low back pain, right rotation, dysfunctional, painful, everything else DN. Uh, he's not really putting weight on his right leg when he's walking very shortened gait. Uh, passively though, he's got plenty of hip extension, uh, Limited hip internal rotation bilaterally, non-painful. The thing that he kept going back to when I was doing my exam is that he said it's in his hip. And I can't get any positive hip orthopedic tests to show up. Uh, So I'm trying to prove to him that it's not his hip. And we take him into, I start doing lumbar orthos, well leg raise, lights up the front of his right hip. Uh, and so that's kind of my biggest thing thus far. Uh, I, I didn't mention earlier, but when we were doing myotomes, uh, seated left or right hip flexion 
he couldn't really lift his leg at all that first day without pain. But other than that, nothing really in his hip reproduced hip pain. Mm -hmm. Um, So the only thing we have right now is that well leg raise and then obviously standing and walking. Um, Started going through a a MBT exam and lumbar press ups started to uh, decrease that sensitivity with the well leg raise. So he got he would get further into the well leg raise before the right hip started to, to scream at him. Um, and then hip flexion was getting a little bit better as well. Put him into a static opener, opening up that right side, which was also slightly palliative. So at that point, that first day, I said, hey, we're going to go home. We're going to do those press ups for the next day or two. Uh, we're going to move quick on it to rule out, rule in that this is your low back, not necessarily your hip. Because at this point, he's still, I don't think he's fully bought that it's not his hip. Um, And so I sent him home with those press-ups, comes back in the next visit, and he reports that he's worse. So he was doing the press-ups at home as as he could. I told him that he could do, you know, the standing lumbar extension version because whenever he was at work, it was hard for him to do it on the ground, Mm -hmm. which looking back on it was probably hard for him to do because he couldn't put, he couldn't put a lot of weight on his right leg. Um, Maybe I should have had him do him against the wall or something. So walking with a limp, attempted a run the morning before the second visit and didn't finish it. Had to take ibuprofen the night before to get to sleep because now he was having intense pain laying, laying down. So just him saying those things, I'm like, all right, well, maybe, maybe we're not on the right track, even though it seemed like that the first day. So I go back and uh, the thing that I was kind of thinking about with him, that he's right on the age border of, do I think this is discogenic? Do I think it could be stenotic? Uh, he has a very stiff T-spine. Oh, yeah. He's got a very stiff T-spine, which we had worked on in the past. Um, And he's had previously some low back pain with, he actually had a, he had a monotomal deficit whenever I was seeing him for that, whatever, Mm -hmm. whatever, I think it was in dorsiflexion. Um, So in the back of my head, that's kind of what I was thinking. So I take him through uh, repeated lumbar flexion. He's worse during, no change after. Uh, in terms of pain or function. Then I, I said, okay, we'll go out of that. We'll look at lateral component, take him through lateral shifts on the right. Again, worse during, no change after. And and that one was probably worse than the flexions. So he's standing against the wall and he can't really push himself into that right side, which also kind of made sense because he was antalgic that way anyway. He wasn't putting weight on that right leg. Um but since he responded to the opener, I said, well, maybe we should look at that anyway. Um, I go back, I should have mentioned previous before doing all of these interventions and rechecked our audits from the first day. The well leg raise was slightly better. I could get him a little farther uh, without or before he started to have that intense pain on in his right hip. And then he can now actively do right hip flexion, but he can't resist it um, in that seated position. (laughs) So, and this is kind of retrospectively looking at, I remember having the conversation with Bo and everybody during this case, because I saw him first on Monday, then I saw him again on Wednesday, and then I saw him again on Friday. So this is Wednesday, the second day. Um... I didn't change anything that he was doing at home on the second visit because I didn't see any appreciable change. If anything else, everything that we did that day made it worse, Um, worse during no change after. So third visit, he comes in feeling about the same. Uh, He's still having to take the ibuprofen at night, which was something he was like, I really don't want to have to do. I don't really like taking medication. Um, and now it's bothering him when he's laying in his bed. 
he has now not tried to run because I told him, I said, hey, we don't, we don't need to be trying to run if you're limping walking around. It's going to create other problems for us that we're going to have to deal with as well. Um, so that day, the main thing, we went back to that visit. Um, were press-ups again to see, hey, was this changing any of our uh, audits from before? Uh, and they did slightly, not, not anything crazy. Um, I had already talked with, with Seth and Daniel, I think, previous to that visit about how I could modify some of the other ways that I was loading him in that lateral shift, which was provocative at that uh, during the standing lateral shift. So I put him in a kneeling position, lateral shift to that right side, no change. Checked for femoral nerve tension, didn't find any prone or sideline. And then Daniel suggested, why don't you check any uh, cutaneous nerve involvement around the lateral femoral cutaneous, any of that. So I had him in that hip flexion test, grab the skin around the anterior part, interlateral part of his hip, pull away as he's doing hip flexion, uh, and no change with that while he's doing that test either. So I was honestly scratching my head a lot. And, and as I read these things, and I've we've already talked with the team a little bit about it, I know where I initially messed up. <laughs> but at that time, before we talked about it, I was like, why, why is none of this responding how I thought it would have? And I think you had, you had asked me, you said, so the thing that originally changed something. We'll explain that just in detail, just so, because a couple of people didn't get the beginning either that came on. The first. Just kind of where you, like what you're talking about in terms of like maybe where the hiccup came from. Yeah. So day one, his range of motion and a well leg raise before he started having the same pain improved with press up. Um, and so that was all I, all I'd sent him home with that day. He came in the next day saying he was worse. And so in my head, I said, well, he said he's worse. So I need to do something different when in actuality, looking back at my, at the audits, he still got farther in that well leg raise before he had symptoms and before he couldn't even do active hip flexion, let alone resisted. Now he could do it actively, couldn't resist it. Um, but was having minimal pain with hip flexion and then the same thing with the well leg raise. So audits were better, but his pain was no different or and he had, states worse. Yeah. And he had tried to run and that kind of made it, you know, exacerbated a little bit. He did his stuff at home, but maybe he didn't do it as often as he could have. Um, so I abandoned that and then was getting frustrated about why this wasn't going the way that I thought it should when I didn't do what I thought I should do, <laughs> which I know, like, and for you, those of you who have heard similar episodes before, like, that's my, I think my thing that I tend to do. Um, yeah, but I pulled up for Alex. If you listen to the Gestalt podcast with uh, yeah. Dr. Philip Snell, Brett, I posted this on my Instagram story, he literally stayed in the middle and then Snell kind of elaborated on it that Brett felt the rookie they're the new clinician kind of go to is to jump around too often without like giving one thing a shot long enough to know that that thing isn't the thing. And that's, and it's no knock on Alex. It's just, he's a newer clinician. And that's kind of what our theme has been with him is. And I, the reason I think this is happening is this is what Philip Snell said is it's soup de jour on seminars and techniques. So then when you get loaded up with so many tools, you think the play is, Oh, I, you're not, you don't see it as abandoning a thought. You think of doing a different technique for the same thing mm -hmm. or trying to figure out the same thing. Whereas you didn't fall. It's like literally you're on a hiking trip in the middle of the woods. You have a compass and you're like, yeah, I knew that told me North, but I'm going to say fuck it on that second visit. Third visit, you're like, yeah, it says North again. Maybe I should go back and look at that compass. So it's like, you have to pick something. We pick audits. You got to stick with them or you abandon them. And that's where pain can, I mean, we know it can mislead you, right? Right or wrong. Be out of pain, no functional change. Yeah, that's not good. 
right? You'd chase that for a few zoos for like, what's going on here? Same thing on this. Well, different thing on this one, which I'd say is more rare. Yeah. Change in the audits. The guy's saying he's worse, not only the same, he's worse. Yeah. But my sentiments were Alex were patients are liars. Don't take his word for what worse is. He could be having a shitty day. Mm-hmm. He could be, who knows? He's just pissed off. He's still in pain, even though his pain may be less. Yeah. I don't know. We have no clue. So just he, audit, 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 audit. He definitely was frustrated with, which is like a, a he and I are close. Like I, I, he jokes with me and, and because I run and I feel like even though I'm not that great of a runner, people are just like, oh, you ran, you know, at a competitive level. Oh, yeah. they, they view it differently. Um, but he, he was frustrated that it, he kept thinking, hey, it's in my hip. My problem is in my hip. And I'm trying to prove to him because it's, we haven't had imaging or anything. It's clear to me that if I move his opposite leg and it creates hip pain and he has no other signs of a positive hip ortho, then why, you know, why would that be an issue in his hip? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of something too that I think I was letting weigh on me a little too much if he's frustrated about that. I'm trying to have that conversation. We had that conversation several times about how, hey, we're still ruling in that this is your this is your low back and I'm fairly certain this is not your hip. Um, so kind of, I guess, the last little fumble on that was that Friday. I had seen him. We had discussed trying to get uh, a steroid pack um, to rule in if that was more of a... Um, we were thinking that paracentral disc issue at this point. Um, and I thought, hey, if we get him a steroid pack, that may get some of these... This intense pain is causing him to you know, limp to, to subside a little more that we could work on it further. And after that point, you and I had talked, he had already left the office and instead of, uh, I was having a hard time figuring out where he could get that. And so you were like, Hey, he could go through his telehealth option or go the ibuprofen route of 800 Mm -hmm. milligrams three times for, for a day. Um, so I had left him a voicemail just saying that, and that was the last I heard from him because I hadn't seen him. I haven't, I haven't seen him since. So that was March 1st. And it's March 18th. I reached out to, uh, to our front desk today and I said, hey, could you guys ch- check on uh, this patient? I just wanted to see how he was doing because um, I hadn't heard anything from him. And so they they checked on him and he said, I've had an MRI and X- and I guess, yeah, Bo doesn't know this either. Um, I've had MRI and x-rays on my back and the same for my hip. Back doctor said my back is fine. They want to do surgery on my hip for a torn labrum. I'm not sold that that's the problem. I think it's a pulled groin. Uh, tell Alex to call me anytime. No hard feelings. Um, which I'm glad that he doesn't think <laughs> that his labrum needs to be operated on. Because, yeah, he definitely could have a torn labrum. But I don't think that's what's creating his pain. But did he have any pods of hip orthos? No. No, he had no positive. He has very limited hip internal rotation on both sides. Um, maybe the first day he got pain when I was compressing over his, like if I'm just shearing uh, P day or A to P on his uh, SI joint, but it wasn't same with nothing with scour, um, log roll. I mean, Faber, none of that. So. I'm at the point where I I haven't called him back yet because Mm -hmm. I looked him up and he's not, his MRI is not American Health or Brookwood. So it's not an MRI that we can see the image in our uh, system. Which, because I want to see it. I want to see the lumbar or the the low back MRI to see if either that radiologist or doctor missed something on there. Um, Because to me... My expectation, if I ordered an image, was going to be to see some sort of central disc bulge. Mm-hmm. That was what I was expecting at this point. Um, and I mean, and Daniel asked me, he goes, "So would that, you know, would that change what you're going to do with him?" And I said, well, not necessarily. Um, I don't think he's at the point where it's surgical, but that's kind of what. If I was going to get the image, that would be where I was at. If we didn't see enough change and enough visits, but I didn't have enough visits with him yet. So Mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been, I didn't order that MRI. Um, 
for that reason and didn't think it was necessary yet. But kind of frustrating that I didn't feel like I handled that conversation very well, didn't follow my audits. And then now I've had two and a half weeks. Which it also gets really, really tough now. And not that the mismanagement, I mean, again, this is now you're getting to see, which is actually good for anybody that's listening to this. You're actually getting to see like a typical conversation we have in our office. This is nothing. I mean, he just, I didn't know any of this. I yeah. just brought this up. I have no clue. So this is typically just stuff we talk about. Like, okay, what could we have done different? I don't know. Maybe you could never do something different. You're just like, oh, did what you could. The only tough thing here is, you know, when I first talked to Alex about this, it was like, if you don't stick with that thing, you're burning time, right? That's the thing. So if you run, it's impossible to, you know, if you have 10 variables in a, a hypothetical experiment, you, the experiment's already moot, right? You don't know what you're testing. So that's what you're saying. Like you actually save time by being more succinct, which we all know, but it's hard to do because you think you're saving time by ooh, 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 going around and getting the thing. Well, then it becomes, well, hey, I'm still in a lot of pain. Well, hey, let's get the steroid pack. Well, shoot, I don't know if that's the best option or we got to find out. Then it goes to the ortho. Now it's like, oh, it's not your back, which we thought it was. It's your hip. And he's like, my back's fine on imaging, which yeah. even at Christmas, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, you know, I would trust the exam all day long over imaging because there have been so many people with I would say hip derangements, right? Labrum tears, yeah. hip nerve change that were like, dude, your hip is a okay. Yeah. Promise you. Um, so that, I mean, it's tough because I don't know any more than Alex does know or now. So it's like, well, God, what, you know, rolling over in bed toward your labrum. I mean, again, it's hard for him to reconcile that because he has no clue what his labrum is, what fiber cartilage is, the mechanisms it would take to tear your labrum. Yeah. Was it degenerative? That was a straw that broke Campbell's back. Don't know. <laughs> but it's tough because now the, I wouldn't say the trust has been broken. It's just messy. And for him, he's like, oh, so what's that mean? Well, now, you know, did he mention anything? They said they wanted to repair it. That was a surgical option. He just said told. they want to do surgery on my hip for a torn labor. Yeah. So the, the best retort, in my opinion, you know, if I'm giving real, uh, real time advice would be, just like Dave King, you know, the hip orthopedic surgeon in St. Louis that Brett's had in uh, DNS classes, I would be, hey, uh, this is the best diagnostic procedure, better than an MRI um, that's used by the top hip surgeon in the world would be to get a lidocaine marking and telling the patient this lidocaine marking injection. That's the injection you got prior, right? I'm guessing they did an arthrogram of his hip. They're telling him that he's got a hip torn labrum. Yeah, I would assume if he had the MRI. So we could ask him, MRI on the hip. hey, did you get an injection? And he could, if he says yes, be like, how'd your hip feel? Mm -hmm. And he might be like, I didn't, or, you know, how did your pain? Does. Well, I didn't notice any difference. Well, hey, they inject you with lidocaine and marcaine before yeah. they pump you full of gadolinium. So, you know, that maybe isn't the thing. Now, if Dave King was doing it, he would, you know, give him that lidocaine marcaine injection, have him lunge, yeah, squat, yeah. whatever hurts. Which for him, it was just standing and walking. So it might have. So maybe like, dude, I did walk out of there feeling better. I don't know. Maybe it is your hip. I don't know. You know, that's kind of the tough thing. You don't know. That's a diagnostic procedure. Having no positive exam findings, that's a tough one to reconcile. Yeah. So um, the fact that, you know, we go back to that first audit, it's just, you're never going to be able to go back in time. So what's the best scenario or what's the best silver lining in this case? You learn to shitload and you're like, I'm going to stick with my audits. I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going to manage the, the extraneous stuff a little bit better. Cause that's all you're trying to do in our profession is like not have that stuff happen again as much as you can. And it's all going to happen to all of us. I mean, yeah. I, I had a lady that Seth was shadowing me as an intern, you know, last fall that came in and i know exactly what was going on i know she had a, a labral tear she knew it too she could do very very little stuff i sent her out of here four visits in for a basically a prolozone injection um or lidocaine marking injection i gave her an option i go you can do this this is just diagnostic and it kind of tells exactly what's going on i go or you can do this and this may help your hip too much money for the the prolozone shot never heard from her after that no clue why or what she was a, i would say a high level referral like mm -hmm. referred from somebody that we really trust and knows us well really well thought we had a great relationship boom gone we had her staff call a couple of times didn't hear from her yeah so it's like you could think you kill it you're not you know whatever it is uh yeah 
you just got to be all over it. But I reference Winchester because he's one of my mentors. I mean, he's really good about being aware of how well you have to manage a case, right? From letting people know all of the things that you think are going on, all of the steps that could exist in treatment, the appropriate referrals that may be in place. So he's like letting people, he's not telling them all this at once, but he's dripping this stuff in. You know, so if you say with him, like, hey, I don't, you know, maybe it's second visit. Hey, like, you know, you're, you know, I know you're feeling worse today, but your symptoms alleviated the first visit. Like, we need to keep going this path. If it doesn't get better in four or five visits, we'll get an image. You know, like you're dripping what the next steps are. So I was like, oh, you got my back. Yeah. Like they, you have some foresight into it. Otherwise, they sometimes people may think, what? You're just going, doing it as you go. Like you have no plan. And th- hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> If it is, that's a problem. But I know that's not the case with Alex. It's just some you have to be overly communicative in the correct way. You don't give them everything at once. You can't pull back. You can't seem unsure. You have to kind of show them, hey, we're here. I know we may have to go A, B, and C. I'm hoping we get here without that. Like I have a goal of we're getting mm-hmm. here, you know, with conservative care without having to have these other interventions to play. So yeah. So I think the only thing that may kind of save this at least for potential future working on this is that I've seen him before yeah. and he kind of likes me. If he was new, I don't think I'm seeing him. Again. <laughs> That's total loss. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, if it were me, I'd, you know, maybe call and just be like, Hey, we were kind of talking and just want to know how your hip felt after you had the, the contrast mm-hmm. in your hip. And, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, Dave King would say, they're not doing contrast for hip MRIs when they do it, mainly because they're preceding them with these light lidocaine marking injections. And then you don't need the visualization field of the contrast because the MRI is usually preemptive for surgery. It's not, they're not really going to do an MRI if the lidocaine yeah. marking doesn't work. They're going to be like, ooh, it's either extra articular, right? Or you're you know, saying in an ideal situation, or they're typically so like say they do a, a clinic if they do, yeah, in their clinic, if they do an injection, not a home run whatsoever. He said, Yeah, we're looking at like, you know, SOAS tendinopathy, uh things like that, lumbar spine referral. So he goes, now we're, you know, maybe referring, looking at other issues. Okay. When you like, said they, I thought you meant like Yeah. But I would say that you meant when you hear somebody at his level, you're like, oh, that, you know, a field shift should occur, but that's not the case. Mm-hmm. If you go to a hip orthopedic surgeon here in Birmingham, you were going to get hit a hip arthrogram. There's going to be no talk of like, you know, using the pain relieving mechanisms of the numbing agent prior to the, the contrast. Um, so I just thought it was a really clever one that I, I really liked. So another little tip, if I haven't said it on here before, when Dave King was doing that talk during DNSC is uh, somebody asked, which is a pertinent question, what's the Number one orthopedic test, it's going to tell you. So he was talking about CAM, uh, basically FAIS and CAM impingements and osteotomies. Like, what's the number one test to show like somebody's going to need a hip surgery if they have a FAIS? And he goes, Faber test. He goes, literally, if you can't get their leg into some semblance of, you know, uh, abduction flexion, external rotation, or they just are in a ton of pain, even as you're, he called it the grip sign, like they grip the tables, mm-hmm. you're taking them into just hip flexion. He goes, it's, they're probably having surgery. <laughs> and he was just like, he's that good. And then the other question I really like with him was why somebody asked, uh, this is on the podcast that they did. He goes, why do you think you're a good surgeon? He goes, I'm kind of a messy, what do you say? A messy carpenter when it comes to surgery. He goes, I'm just really good at candidate selection. Hmm. So his examination process, pre-screening procedures, paperwork, things they've done previously, is the elimination factor, which that's also what Thomas Bird out of uh, uh, Belmont University would say as well. Is like it's just his screening ability to get the right candidates in, the the wrong ones out. So that should speak to us as conservative musculoskeletal people of we're not kicking people in and out, but you're doing what you're triaging people into the appropriate buckets, whether that's a referral, what intervention you use, not treating them because of a red flag scenario for your practice, whatever it is, like. You have to be world class at that, and that's why those guys are world class. Mm-hmm. Um, I really apologize. I um, we've got two people besides my wife on here and Alex. I don't know what happened with the meeting. The meeting that I put out there, and I apologize. And the email and Facebook residency is the one that we clicked on because that's how Sloan got in here. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw Aaron Meyer got in and left. So I don't know what happened with the meeting, guys. I apologize if you're listening to this. Angelica Charles, I know you guys both sent me the same screenshot. 
I don't know what happened. Um, I'll play around with it. I really apologize if that happened to a bunch of people that were trying to get in tonight. I only got contacted by Angelico, so I appreciate that. Um, this I was worried that it was like a cutoff time. Like if I wasn't in by 6.15. Uh, that's why I said I, in the email, I was like, I logged on at 6.18. I was just late from work. <laughs> did it Did it give you guys an option to put a password in or anything? Because that's the only thing I changed since last time. I was yeah. trying to make it so you guys didn't have to sit in a waiting room and just put a passcode in. So I didn't know. Um, so, something. well, okay. Like, of course, I'm like already three minutes late. And then it wanted me to update it. <laughs> oh, and yeah. so I updated it. And then um, I, I think that um, I couldn't tell if it was my browser or not, but then I just like Googled like log into Zoom meeting and I actually had to put the ID in and then it asked for the password. But huh. from the link you sent me, it did not ask for the password. Mm. Huh. I'll have to play around with it. So sorry guys. I yeah, I don't know what's up. Because when I sent you guys the link around now, I saw it was a different meeting ID. So I don't I don't know. Uh, we'll get it figured out. So, um, Charles, Angelica, do you have any questions <laughs> since you're alone too? Um, if not, I'll let everybody hop off here, see if we have any uh, questions from my wife or my kids before they go to bed. No, I don't think so. I did miss the beginning, so I'm going to probably go back and listen yeah. because I feel like um, just recently, I feel like we've had maybe like two or three like cases kind of similar not not in the fact that it's a hip but kind of just like being more aware of like coming back to the audit um so i think i'm just going to go back and listen specifically to like what you said he was suffering from just mm -hmm. because i think this has come up a couple times but then also it just kind of uh, I think I'm just too sensitive, but it does hurt my feelings when someone just like doesn't show back up and then they're like, yeah, I just went ahead and got an MRI or an x-ray and I'm like, okay, well, that's cool, <laughs> like, but I don't know. So I, I'm thankful that it doesn't just happen to us, but I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's, I, again, if you've ever shadowed, uh, Winchester, you'll always hear him talking about when imaging would occur if it would be needed during treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's for that reason, because he knows people will pull the trigger, go to primary care, you can go to an imaging center now, mm -hmm. you can literally do walk-in MRI stuff. So I think that's why he's doing it, is to control, manage the case of being like, Hey, we get four visits in, like we may pull the trigger. We may have to pull, he may even say something like, we may have to pull the trigger on an MRI to see what's going on or to make sure that X, Y, Z is not there. So again, it's hard in the beginning, but the more, you know, swings you get, you kind of get a pretty clear picture within the first, you know, visit of a patient by the time you're doing kind of a, Hey, let's talk things over review before we get you out of the office today of like, man, I kind of know where this thing's going. I know the pivots that may have to occur. And I also know what I don't know, which I think you should be very clear on the things you're not sure about with the patient, as crazy as that sounds. So when I'm like, I mean, I'm trying to think today. So a lady came in that has been started like really up and running for the last six weeks. She's kind of limping in here and she says, yeah, I just kind of got hip pain. She's pointing to her butt. So all of us are, you know, trying to think rule out low back. She even says that she had like a bit of sciatica with her uh, second kid that's only three years old. So it wasn't all that long ago. Um, she said that when I asked her, she's like, oh, I didn't think about that. Uh, we get into it though. Jumping hurts, right? Forward flexion, nothing. Nothing with movement in her back. There's no radicular symptoms. Sitting in a car hurts. Running hurts. Uh, all these things. And I was like, dude, it really seems like, you know, kind of glute tendinopathy, trigger point stuff. Big trigger point in your hip. But I told her, I go, you know what? Your lumbar spine, you do have a decent extension restriction. It just seems a bit odd that like, you know, this thing kind of came out of nowhere. There, yeah, you've been running. So I told her, I go, I'm not sure which one it is. Guess what? I'm hedging my bets. Guess what I sent her home with? Bunch of lumbar extensions and low oblique sets. Because she has a trigger point in her hip and her lumbar spine has an extension restriction. I see no problems with that. And you'd be like, well, how do you know which one worked? I don't know if her low back is facilitating your glute right? And creating a trigger point, which is a high possibility. I don't know if her, she has, you know, 
a restriction on the lumbar spine that's just standalone from her right hip being different because the other audit with her was single leg stance on her right side's off. And I told her, Hey, that's the thing I'm going after. I'm trying to get you out of pain as fast as we can. And so I said, I'm going to send you home with these two things. I'm going to see you Thursday and we're going to see how your pain's doing. And then we'll be able to suss it out further. I have no qualms with that because I, I told her, I said, I'm playing both sides of the coin because I can get you there as fast. I could be like a purist and be like, oh, I'm just going to do extensions. Nothing led me there other than a joint restriction. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't pain. So I had to follow the audit. Why wouldn't I send somebody home? If you had a tight ankle, send them home with triangle or triplanar ankle moves. Cool. Moving their ankle around. Mm -hmm. I, I have no qualms with that. Um, Charles said, no, I don't see Miss Joke on this first section of this meeting. Let's go back. I have do more questions about cases. I'll post Facebook group. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. My case. Yeah. Gymnast coming back from ankle surgery. Uh, also, uh, anybody that's listening to this after the fact that didn't get to join us, which was maybe a lot of people, maybe not, maybe no one to come on. Um, I'm hoping it was a technical difficulty, but try if you are out there, if you have a case that you've been having problems with a case that you think is really cool. Whatever it is, we have a form on the residency page. It's uh, on one of those links to fill out where you can put in your own case. And you can present it on here if you want. We can present it. We can troubleshoot it, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's just a little different. So I think that becomes a little more interesting for us instead of us just doing case after case after case. Mm -hmm. uh, also, as I said, we had Cop on. We had Chad Sherman on. Next up, we got Snell talking about his research process. Do you have ideas of other people that you'd uh, like to hear on the show or uh, hear me interview? Let me know as well in the Facebook group. Thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe via YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. If you like the message, please share it. We appreciate it. Thank you.